Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to wait just another minute as people filter in from the waiting room. And I think we're almost there. So why don't we just jump in? Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Kara Horowitz. I'm the co-executive director of the Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. I already see many familiar places, faces in the um, in the participant list. So thanks so much for joining us at UCLA. Um, I'm thrilled to have Richard Lazarus with us today to discuss his terrific new book, uh, The Rule of Five, Making Climate History at the Supreme Court. I have a note to myself to show off the book. Um, Richard, as many of you know, is one of the foremost environmental law scholars in the country. He is the Howard and Catherine Abel Professor of Law at Harvard University, where he teaches environmental law, natural resources law, Supreme Court advocacy and torts. Professor Lazarus has represented the United States, states and local governments and environmental groups in the United States Supreme Court in over 40 cases and has presented oral argument to the court in 14 of those cases. And he's written and published several books, including The Making of Environmental Law, Environmental Law Stories. He's also the principal author of the report to the president of the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill many years ago. In this latest book, Richard tells the fascinating story of the most important environmental law case that's ever been in the Supreme Court, Massachusetts versus EPA. As many of you know, this is the landmark case that cleared the path for EPA to begin regulating greenhouse gases and climate change. One reviewer called Richard's book, A Riveting Story Beautifully Told which for any of us who have tried to write about um, legal cases knows that's quite high praise. Um, another declared it a masterclass in how the Supreme Court works and more broadly, how major cases navigate through the legal system. I have to say, I found it to be a fantastic tale and I whipped through it with pleasure. I encourage you all to check it out and I can't wait to hear Richard tell us more about it. Professor Lazarus will talk about the book for a bit and then I'm gonna take questions for him through the chat room. So if you have questions that come up as you're hearing the talk, please type them in the chat and I'll be keeping a cue. And with that, I'm really thrilled to hand it over. Richard's told me there's gonna be a little bit of a lag while he puts up his slides. So with that, Richard, please take it away and welcome again. Thanks, Carla. Take just a second to share a screen. Everyone see it? We're in good shape. And there's no requirement, uh, but I strongly encourage people to turn their screens on uh, because it's so much more fun for me uh, to see to see people. Uh, I enjoy that uh, a lot. Uh, I hate giving these talks remotely where I can't see anybody. Um, anyway, Car, I'm really delighted to participate uh, in this event sponsored by UCLA's Emmett Institute. Um, UCLA has a spectacular environmental law program. Uh, I've long been admired of its faculty. Its faculty is sort of staggering uh, in its depth and its quality. You've got Cara, you've got Anne uh, on, on loan at the moment to the federal government, uh, David, Boyd, Ted uh, Parson, uh, Jim Saltzman, Alex Wayne, Timothy Malloy, Jonathan Zasloff. And I want to give a special shout out to my former student. I don't know if she's here anywhere, but Julia Stein. Uh, who's also, and I see some uh, some good friends from other schools. I see uh, Rob uh, Glickston uh, from GW, uh, which is always a pleasure to see, and a lot of friends, not just uh, students, when I look around um, as well. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about um, is this book, book Carr mentioned, The Rule of Five, Making Climate History at the Supreme Court. My talk to be divided into three parts, uh, I'm followed by Q&A. First, I'll give you a sense of the arc of the story and my overall goal in writing the book. Uh, then I wanna highlight parts of the book story, just go through it, provide you with a sense of the book's voice, what makes I think the story so engaging. Uh, I, I guess I'll give you, I won't hide any, hold anything back, but I still hope you read the book uh, afterwards. I think you all, many of you know the end result of the case, but there's a lot about the case you won't know. Uh, and third, I wanted to describe an unanticipated challenge I had uh, in writing this book and then how I chose uh, to address it. All right, so what's uh, the book's uh, arc and its primary objective? Uh, it's divided into 20 chapters, 
uh, followed by an epilogue. If during the Q&A you want, you can ask me why I, I titled one of the chapters, chapter three, a turd. Uh, my wife, when I was working on the book, saw me doing that. She said, you are not going to publish a book with a chapter called The Turd. Uh, I did anyway, and we're still happily married, I can, uh, I can report. Now, the, the book uh, begins uh, with a guy named Joe, uh, actually a graduate of GW uh, Law School, uh, and it uh, ends uh, with the Supreme Court ruling uh, that, that made history. Uh, the most important environmental law case ever decided by the Supreme Court uh, that's Massachusetts versus EPA, often referred to as environmental law's own Brown v. Board of Education, uh, a case which not only transformed U.S. climate change law, uh, but had worldwide impact. We would not have had the Paris Agreement uh, without Massachusetts v. EPA. Uh, my primary objective in writing this book was twofold. Uh, first, I wanted to write a book, unlike others, I want to write a book for a popular audience that revealed what makes Supreme Court advocacy so challenging, uh, so fascinating, and from both sides of the lectern, uh, where the advocate stands to argue before the justices, but then also the other side of the lectern within the chambers themselves, where a lot of advocacy happens uh, as well. Uh, I also want to open a window to let the general public see inside the extraordinary amount of strategy, maneuvering, conflict, uh, the personal professional drama uh, in Supreme Court litigation, not from bad motives, but just because the stakes are so high. I also wanted to write a book for a general audience who revealed what has made it so difficult for our country to address the climate change issue. Why it's proven so hard over decades, often reasons most people don't appreciate. And why for that reason, this case was so important. Uh, there's no more important environmental issue facing uh, the United States, of course, the world, uh, than climate change. And as the uh, coronavirus has um, tragically underscored, uh, there's no escape the need for global cooperation when you have these kinds of global threats. So I began researching the book in 2015 through 2016. Uh, I really wrote the book uh, in 2018, 2019, published last March. Not the best time it turns out to publish uh, a book. Uh, I approached uh, my research for this book the way I would a Supreme Court uh, brief, scorched earth. I interviewed everybody. Uh, I had Clinton administration officials, Bush administration officials, the environmental attorneys, uh, the state uh, attorneys, the EPA folks, the DOJ folks, the judges and the justices. Um, only one justice on the record, but three justices total. I would never talk to a law clerk. I did talk to law clerks, only, but I only do it after a judge or justice gave me permission to do so. Um, and that's because I'm a law professor uh, and I could not possibly ask those people to do something um, that I would never tell them they should do, uh, which is talk to somebody uh, about confidential material unless their judge said it, it was okay. Uh, I also sought the underlying documents. I ended up knowing far more about this case than any of the participants um, who were surprised by things they learned from the book. I had public record requests, FRI requests, but mostly I got things voluntarily from everybody. Boxes and boxes and boxes, all their emails, all their draft briefs uh, and jump drives. Uh, I don't think everyone was happy that I got all that stuff, uh, but I did. Um, and I think it may allow me to tell a very um, revealing and objective story. All right, here are a few highlights for the book. These are illustrative parts of the story. Uh, chapter one, of course, is the opening scene. It's October, 1999. And after a year delay, a guy named Joe Mendelson walks from his Capitol office down to EPA and hand delivers a petition to EPA. Petition that demands the Clinton administration, this is the Clinton administration, regulate greenhouse gas emissions for motor vehicles. Joe was simply fed up. He's fed up by the lack of action by the Clinton administration on climate uh, for basically, at that point, right, seven years. Uh, so who was Joe Mendelson? He was a young public district lawyer who worked for a public interest organization no one basically had ever heard of, the Center for Technology Assessment. He had a total of five employees there, uh, full-time and part-time together. They worked paycheck to paycheck, and often for no paycheck at all. They had small offices on Capitol Hill, I mean, small offices on Capitol Hill, that for which they were evicted just a few weeks before this uh, because they were, in a, they were not uh, in a place that was not zoned uh, for other than residential uh, living. And Joe worked very much alone. He worked on petition late at night by his daughter's crib. Uh, none of the powerful national environmental groups like NRDC, Sierra Club, Earth Justice, none of them supported what he was trying to do. 
In fact, they actively opposed it. And they even tried at one point later on to cut off his funding because uh, they didn't have much funding because they thought this litigation was a mistake. Uh, Joe refused to bend. Uh, he filed a petition demanding the EPA act. His feeling was, they're not my bosses, these national groups. They couldn't tell him what to do. Uh, he was in a job of advocacy, not acquiescence. It took a year for him, though, after he drafted the petition, put it in the desk drawer to actually file it because of all the pressure to pull the trigger. He finished in October 98. He pulled the trigger in October 1999. Um, and that's when he walked down the hall. Uh, sorry, walked down the EPA and hand filed it. The petition made its way to a docket room at EPA. EPA had just moved into its new uh, building uh, in the old Federal Triangle area of DC. Uh, it went docket room, was formally received by a docket clerk named Jamie Poole. Uh, she signed it, uh, stamped it, put it in a metal cart, actually found the metal cart, walked, they pushed it down the hallway, EPA General Counsel's office. No one then imagined back then in November two, 1999 that eight years later, this petition would be in the United States Supreme Court. Now, at first, what's interesting, this was new for me when I really researched this. At first, it was actually reason to think EPA and the Bush administration might grant it. Not the Clinton administration, which didn't, but the Bush administration might grant it. Uh, that's because George Bush, when he ran for president in 2000, in September, he made a campaign pledge to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Gore hadn't, Bush did. Uh, now Gore would have been elected, but he wasn't making a big deal of a campaign trail. Bush went to the left of him uh, on this issue during the campaign. Uh, and when he took office, every reason to think he would do it. Uh, here were some of his major cabinet people. He made head of EPA, Christine Todd Whitman. Now, not everyone here will know who that is, but she was a household name in 2001. Former governor of New Jersey, uh, she was presidential timber. Uh, she was highly acclaimed Republican, moderate Republican governor from New Jersey. And she took the job because she wanted to regulate climate change, climate emissions. She had done New Jersey. He wanted to do it aggressively. She told Bush that. Colin Powell was secretary of state. He believed this is a major national security issue, climate change. He had a briefing on climate change within a week of the inauguration, right, at the State Department. Condoleezza Rice was a national security advisor. She also thought this was a major issue of national security. And no one was more hawkish than Paul O'Neill, who many of you don't know. Paul O'Neill was Secretary of Treasury. Paul O'Neill felt so strongly about the climate issue that at the very first cabinet meeting, a few days of inauguration, he went to the White House early, he went to the cabinet room, he placed in front of everyone's chair a copy of a speech he'd given a year earlier where he compared the threat of climate change to nuclear holocaust. So everything was in place. It thought they were really gonna do it. And then of course, this guy happened. Uh, Dick Cheney, no one could outmaneuver Dick Cheney. And within a couple of weeks, he persuaded Bush to renege on his campaign pledge. And Bush, Bush did it formally. He sent a formal letter to Congress in response to a orchestrated letter sent by some senators to Bush that Cheney orchestrated. And Bush responded to it by saying, I'm not gonna regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And then he also said, and they have no authority to do so under the Clean Air Act. It's not an air pollutant. In this letter, Bush answered not just a question of policy, a question of law. He said, greenhouse gas are not air pollutants within the meaning of the Clean Air Act. It's astounding for a president to do that. They never once consulted with EPA, never consulted with any EPA lawyers to general counsel's office. Whitman was completely kneecapped. And as a practical matter, her career was over at EPA. Uh, she was sort of a ghost-like walking uh, for a few years before uh, she in fact led. Uh, this came out uh, a couple months after Whitman formally left. This was a formal denial of Joe's petition. So they acted on it. And it had basically two grounds for denying Joe's petition. The first one was consistent as they had to. The President of the United States had answered the legal question. And they said, we have no authority under the Clean Air Act. Greenhouse gases are not air pollutants. That had been dictated to them by, right, the commander in chief, the chief executive officer. Then they added a backup argument that even if we did have authority, it's not the right time to exercise it. And they listed a series of reasons why it was not the right time. Uh, at that point then, uh, they had to get to court. But since EPA had denied the petition, 
Joe now had a final agency action, and he could take that to court. Uh, there was nothing easy or, or smooth about that path ultimately to the Supreme Court. Uh, by the time Joe's case reached the Supreme by the courts, it was a D.C. circuit because of the Clean Air Act. There's exclusive jurisdiction on the D.C. circuit. Doesn't go to district court, goes right to D.C. circuit. Um, by the time it reached the courts, he was no longer alone. Uh, now there were hundreds of lawyers on his side for about a dozen states and more than two dozen environmental groups. Uh, and all the leading uh, lawyers of the environmental groups were involved. And they called themselves the carbon dioxide lawyers, carbon dioxide warriors, excuse me. Uh, when they lost that first round of the DC circuit in a just uh, boggling uh, split opinion uh, where Judge Santel said there was no standing. Uh, Judge Randolph said, "There's. I'm not going to talk about standing, not going to talk about whether greenhouse gas air pollutants. I think they didn't abuse the discretion not to decide. Uh, and Tatel wrote a dissent saying, I think they have standing. I, it's clearly an air pollutant and EPA abuses discretion. But there was no actual precedent established by the DC Circuit. But the, when they lost in the DC Circuit, only one attorney out of the hundreds on the petitioner's side thought they should seek Supreme Court review. Uh, everyone else thought it was a terrible idea. This guy, Jim Milkey, uh, who was in the Massachusetts AG's office and headed the environmental office for the Massachusetts AG. Uh, everyone said, bad idea. Jim said, I think we should roll the dice. I think we should seek further review. Uh, I don't think we should acquiesce in this loss. Others said, this is a disaster. Seeking further review, you risk a major loss. We could lose on standing, which would be a disaster. Let's wait for another case. No precedent was established by the DC Circuit. Let's wait for California. There's a case is out in California. In the Ninth Circuit, we're going to have a chance to raise those issues. Let's not do it. The pressure on Milky was enormous. He received calls. His boss received calls uh, not to do it. Uh, and he was called by the head of the NRDC, Francis Beinecke, who's a fabulous person and president of NRDC at the time. And she said, the future of the environmental movement is on your head if you take this up. Uh, that's what the kind of pressure Massachusetts was under. Uh, Jim uh, decided to do it. They had no power to stop him. Anybody could, any one of the parties could take it up. They actually joined the petition, not because they believed in it, because they wanted to control the arguments, and because they actually thought it wouldn't be granted anyway. There was no circuit conflict. The DC Circuit hadn't really decided anything. The Supreme Court's decision to grant the case on June 26, 2006 was a shock. You can see they granted some other cases that day, which you lawyers will recognize. This is sort of a banner day of interesting cases granted uh, by the Supreme Court. Uh, they granted it. No one could believe it. Right? They were floored when it was granted. And for good reason. This was the first time the Supreme Court had granted review at the request of the environmentalists over the government's objection since 1971. Sierra Club Morton. They had not done it since then. It had been 35 years since they had done it. And of course, they lost here, Cluffy Morton, on standing uh, as well. Uh, everyone couldn't believe they granted it. It, it began to sink on a milky. He said, you know, what have I done? What have we done? Because we can now, it's one thing you got to count to four to grant review. You got to count to five to win a case in the Supreme Court. And it wasn't clear who the four were. The four could have been conservative justices looking to sink them uh, on standing. Uh, chapter 12 of the book talks about uh, the battle over who should present oral argument for the Supreme Court. They wrote the briefs uh, over the summer, uh, and as soon as the brief was done, a uh, big question within the petitioner's side over who should do an oral argument. And they agreed on several things. Everyone agreed the best person on the team <clears throat> of 100 lawyers should present the argument. They also all agreed they should make the best, strongest argument. Then after that, as lawyers tend to be, a little disagreement about, <clears throat> excuse me, who that person was, who was the best person, and what were the best arguments. It all came down to two people. The states favored one person, <clears throat> the environmental groups favored another. It was a good faith disagreement. They were both strong candidates. They Each one probably could have done a great job. It's not unusual in Supreme Court litigation to have that conflict because the Supreme Court, unlike the lower courts, allows one. No matter how many people are on the same side, how many lawyers, one, unlike the DC Circuit. 
They don't want multiple lawyers staying up there. <clears throat> Excuse me. They just want one uh, to do it. Um, this was a battle like I've seen many times. Sometimes people flip coins to decide, literally, they flip a coin to decide. <clears throat> but this one was as intense and destructive as I've ever seen. I've seen lots of fights. It was such a destructive conflict between the two sides on the same side that it has been, that was 2006. So we're talking, what, 15 years later? Uh, and people still aren't speaking to each other. And they won the case. They didn't lose the case. They won the case. Uh, it was that intense. And they weren't speaking to each other for the last two months before the oral argument uh, as well. Even after it was seemingly settled <clears throat> that Jim Milkey from Massachusetts would do the case, he had been the counsel of record uh, in the case, uh, even after it was settled that he would do it, um, the environmental groups attempted a coup only days before the argument. On a Saturday morning, uh, Jim Milkey received a phone call uh, from an attorney from Sierra Club, a former colleague of his at Mass AG's office, and somebody he considered a friend, telling him he had to step aside, uh, that they had to be replaced with their preferred attorney, that he just wasn't up to the job. It was a crazy idea. Uh, you can't do that, that close to the argument. Uh, but the craziness of it underscores the depth of distrust within that team. Uh, Milky uh, replied, that's not going to, to happen. Uh, the next several chapters of the book uh, describe the oral argument in the case. Now, these chapters are designed to give the reader a sense of the stunning physical setting of the courtroom, uh, the extraordinary give and take between the justices and advocates, but also in the justices. What many people don't realize is at oral argument in the Supreme Court, I'm talking about real oral argument, not the stuff that's going on right now which is just a make weight argument until they came back uh, in the courtroom. Um, in real arg argument, what's important about it is not so much just the advocate answering questions. It's the oral argument is the first time by tradition that justices learn what their colleagues think about a case. They don't talk about a case beforehand. So when they come to the bench, they learn for the first time what others think. So the argument comes away for one justice to try to influence another justice through their questions. Scalia became the master of that when he joined the court in September 86. And that's when the number of questions literally doubled uh, in the Supreme Court with Scalia joining uh, the bench. Uh, and so when you're an advocate, your chance is to participate in their conversation. You learn what they think, uh, the other justice learn what they think, and you get to participate through your answers of the questions. Now the challenge for the advocate is considerable. You have to decide how to frame the case in the way most likely to win. That makes a huge difference. If it's framed one way, you might win. If you frame it another way, and they see it that way, you might well lose. You also anticipate all the hard questions uh, and develop crisp answers. The norm these days is you get asked 50 to 75 questions in 30 minutes. That's a lot of questions. And since the questions themselves take some of your 30 minutes up, you have to have really efficient answers. Uh, and not uh, go on a, on a tangent or not say something incorrect. Uh, the justices' questions are really good too. Uh, whatever you think of the ideology, these, they're, it's a really smart bench. They're good lawyers, they ask good questions. Hitting, answering a question, I think is equivalent of hitting a major league baseball pitch. Uh, you don't know what's gonna happen, what kind of pitch is gonna be, you have to be ready for anything. The book describes the oral argument in detail, uh, Milky's back and forth with Justice Scalia and Chief Justice Roberts in particular. Milky was asked 23 questions from Scalia alone, especially on the standing issue, the issue he could not afford to lose this case on. Um, Scalia was all over him in the beginning. So what I'm going to do now for fun, I'm going to play you some snippets from the oral argument. Um, and as soon as it happens, I want you to give me a quick thumb so I know that you're hearing uh, what it is. Um, oh, there are justices, uh, which is always, always fun to do. Matter of fact, we'll do it again. Uh, all right, uh, let's get, uh, this is how Jim Milkey starts his argument uh, and listen to it. Mr. Milkey. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. If I may, I'd like to frame the, uh, the merits very quickly and then turn immediately to standing. Although the case before you arises in an important policy area, 
It turns on ordinary principles of statutory interpretation and administrative law. EPA made a decision based on two grounds, both of which constitute plain errors of law reviewable under any standard. It's not asking the Court to pass judgment on the science of climate change or to order EPA to set emission standards. We simply want EPA to revisit the rulemaking petition based on permissible considerations. Now, imagine that you were a climate activist, and here's your big case. They've worked years. You've spent the night, which they did, you spent the night on the cold sidewalk in the Supreme Court, and it was cold on November 28, 2006. So you could be one of the few people could get in to the public section that morning. You get there. The argument begins, there is your ch climate champion, Jim Milkey. And this is how it begins, right? We're not asking the court to pass judgment. We're not asking you to order EPA to do anything. All we want is you to visit, get EPA to visit the rulemaking petition based on permissible consideration. There's no, right? Rhetorical outrage about climate, how the Bush administration, they've done nothing. We got to get them to, none of it's there. This is not a climate case. This is an administrative law case. Why? He wants to win the case. So he's going to pitch the case to the people who are deciding the case. He's not giving a talk, right, to a, to a climate activist. He's not testifying before Congress. He's not running for office. He's got nine justices. And while it may, may make your heart, not all of you, but some of your hearts go pitter-patter, and my hearts go pitter-patter, talk about climate change. What makes just the Supreme Court heart go pitter-patter is administrative law. That's what they care about. That's their language. Uh, and he has to make this case, right, a low, he has to lowball it. I'm not asking for much. Just a little bit, or just ordinary principle of ministry, nothing radical, nothing transformative, nothing. You don't have to hardly do anything here. All you have to do is this one simple, modest thing. Now, of course, when they petition for cert, this is the most important, biggest case in the world. But now he's trying to win the case, it becomes just a little simple question of applying ordinary principle of administrative law. Why? That's how he's going to count to five. There are not environmentalists on this court. He has to get to five. It's Justice Brennan's famous rule. The most important rule of federal constitutional law, according to Brennan, is the rule of five. It takes five justices. So he's lowballing it. He's going for five. He doesn't want to lose it on standing. And he immediately, notice that he says, I'd like to frame the merits very quickly and then turn immediately standing. That's because he knows Scalia is about to jump on him, all over him on standing. And he's got weaknesses on standing. It's not a clear winner on standing. But he wants to get his merits out first. So his first line is, Scalia, I'll be there in a moment, but let me get out my framing. The amount of time spent on working on these words is considerable. It's like the beginning of a Broadway play. It sounds natural. Every single thing is planned. Uh, he then has jumped on for Scalia on and on. He does a, actually a great job pairing with Scalia uh, and the chief. And then this moment happens at argument. Listen. What's your, what's your authority for that? I have the same question as the Chief Justice. I was looking to brief for the strongest case. Suppose there were a, land, a big landowner that owned lots of coastline. What, would he have the same standing that you do, or do you have some special standing as a state? And if so, what is the case which would demonstrate that? Oh, you're so that's what he asks. And actually, Milky doesn't have a particularly good answer for whether states should have a special standing. Why? Because that was not a favorite argument you're representing states and environmental groups. Environmental groups didn't really want to win this, that you have standing if you're a state, you don't have standing if you're an environmental group. So it's very hard for them to give a state's only argument. And they never really briefed it that way. And then this happens. Kennedy says, what about Georgia v. Tennessee Copper, 1907 decision? Is that your best case? In all the dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe 35, 40 brief files in this case, discussing saying no one had cited Georgia v. Tennessee Cup. Kennedy found it on his own. Milky thought to himself, I don't know what that case is. But if it's good enough for Justice Kennedy, it's good enough for me. And when this happened in the courtroom, everyone went up because they knew they weren't going to lose on standing. Because Kennedy has done his own work. And so the worst case was unlikely to happen with this. 
Chief Justice Roberts spotted this. He also knew they were strong on the authority where the greenhouse gas and the air pollutants. He immediately pivoted to the third issue, which actually was a weak argument for the petitioners. He pivoted to that one. He wanted to basically say, why is it the EPA abuses discretion? What is it in the statute which said EPA had to act on this petition? A petition for which there was no provision in the Clean Air Act which allowed you to file this petition, let alone a deadline by which EPA had to act on it. Listen to the chief. The first day this law is passed, I, I, there are a lot of air pollutants that come out of motor vehicles. I mean, is EPA immediately in violation of this statute if they don't issue uh, uh, emissions regulations for every one of those air pollutants on day one? No. Um, and presumably the principle that they want to deal with what they regard as the more serious threats sooner. They want to deal with lead first, and then they want to deal with other stuff. I mean, wh what, yeah. what is the... What, when do they, I guess, move into an abuse of discretion and not exercising a judgment with respect to a particular pollution? The answer it's a great question because he's saying, all right, when, did, when was it abuse of discretion? Day one, day two, day three. If you ever follow the chief classic Roberts question, he does it in all of his cases, all of his environmental cases. It's sometimes one day, two day, three days. Sometimes it's one inch, two inch, three inch. Uh, you can see it in the County Maui case. You can see it in the Rapanos case. He always wants to know where you draw the line. And this is hard to answer because under the Clean Act, there is no time, nothing on the statute to suggest they had to act on this one rather than other problems before this one. So how do they abuse the discretion? Watch what Milky says. The answer is when they don't rely on any of those grounds. In other words, if they had said here, we have other things we're doing first that are more important, that would have been the end of the case. If they had relied on background principles of administrative law to say, we are just, you know, we have limited resources and you have to defer to our judgment which kinds of things we do first. We have Water Act, Hazardous Waste, Clean Air Act, TSCA, FIFRA, you know, we can't do everything at once. We'll get to it. They couldn't have been really been questioned. He said, when they do that, that's fine. They didn't do it here. But here instead, they said, we disagree with the regulatory approach. They gave a bad reason. If they get a good reason, we'd be out of business. They gave a bad reason. They could have given good reasons. So watch what Ginsburg then does. And we all missed her voice. You were right, and then it went back, and the EPA then said, well, an uh, obvious reason also is constraint on our own resources Suppose they said that. You said they didn't say it this time around, but how far do you get if all that's going to happen is it goes back and then EPA says our resources are constrained and we're not going to spend them on this? Your Honor. So she's saying, is that all this is about? EPA said the wrong thing. So what are you going to get from this? A remand where EPA then says the right thing and we're back to square one? And he says, yeah, yeah. EPA has to say the right thing. And if they do say the right thing, we'll be limited to an arbitrary and capricious review and we may not win, but they have to say the right thing. So he's making the smallest ask of the world, right? It comes down to nothing. So why is he doing it? He wants to win the case. You know, you can have things you want to ask for, but you lose the case. And that's why I've always said the best environmental lawyers are not the best environmentalists. I'm sorry. They're the best lawyers who are environmentalists. They're being really good lawyers here. They're figuring out how to win their case. It's a small ask. If they can win on this, they can get the court to address the authority question, whether greenhouse gas air pollutes. If not, the court doesn't have to address that question. That's what they want the court to address, is issue two. They want to win on standing, have the court say, greenhouse gases um, are pollutants, huge win for them, and then get it remanded back to EPA. They're not getting anything anyway, probably from EPA, until they get a good administration. So he gives the best answer he can. Uh, the book then switches uh, to the other side of the lectern, uh, and that's from where the advocates argue to the, where, behind the red curtains, uh, and that's where the justices sit, um, where the justice and law clerks work in their chambers, and it describes what happens at conference, uh, where they all sit, why they sit in a certain direction, and how they discuss and vote uh, at conference. The justices here met two days after the argument, met Friday morning, December 1st. Um, no one is ever present in the conference room but the justices themselves. They sit by seniority with the chief on one side, the next most senior justice, then John Paul Stevens 
on the other side, and then it goes Scalia, Kennedy, uh, Thomas, Souter, uh, Ginsburg, Breyer. Alito was the junior justice uh, at the time. His job is to answer the door if anyone knocks on it, uh, and also to take the notes as the secretary, formal secretary of what happens at conference. They discuss the case in a set order, and uh, that is the chief justice goes first. There's no deliberate, chief goes first, you summarize the case, he votes. Then Stevens says his reasons and votes and sort of around uh, to Justice Alito. Uh, there's no discussion among all of them before they vote. They actually vote. Uh, opposite the DC Circuit, junior judge votes first, Supreme Court senior judge votes first. Everyone here is waiting for Kennedy. Kennedy votes, he votes to reverse in favor. At that point, now Justice John Paul Stevens is the senior justice of the majority by five to four. So he has a major job to do. Uh, and that is decide who's gonna write the opinion for the court. Because the votes at conference are tentative and justices change their mind all the time. And Justice Kennedy is known to change his mind in civil rights cases, environmental cases. His vote is often lost. Uh, and so Kenneth Stevens, who I met with, had a big challenge here. He wanted to assign the opinion to himself because this was one of the few cases that term where actually he was a senior justice of the majority, where the only five fours with a liberal progressive wing was winning. They're win losing everything else. Uh, that that term, 2006 term. And this is a big case and a case he cared about. On the other hand, if he took the opinion, he might lose Kennedy. He knew Brennan did that once in a major civil rights case and he learned that lesson. And the best way to keep Kennedy was to give Kennedy the opinion. That's a technique that is often used. Give it to the marginal justice because then they're less likely to switch their vote because they'll write it in a way that works for them and they'll feel possession of it and feel like they can't abandon because they have an institutional responsibility. So Stevens thought about it. And he finally decided, I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. He told me he felt very strongly about this case. He said, I'm a Republican. I couldn't understand why a Republican party was not concerned about climate. And I wanted to send a message. I wanted to write this opinion, not to lawyers and law professors. I want to write an opinion to the American public. I wanted to write an opinion that everyone could read and they could get. Uh, so Kennedy, uh, sorry, Stevens took the opinion and then his challenge was to keep Kennedy's vote. He issued, he released his first draft a month or so later, he got, including his own, four votes. And the dissent was four votes, two dissents, Scalia and, Rank and Roberts. Draft number two, four votes, three, four votes five, four votes, six. And along the way, he's making compromise. He's trying to do things on standing and the rest. He's trying to get Kennedy uh, to come over. Um, it becomes such a compromise coming along the way that at one point, Souter is kind of a little frustrated by it. Souter drafts a concurring opinion, which chastises EPA for not going more quickly, quoting Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and Ginsburg joins it. Draft seven, four votes. Finally, draft eight, Kennedy joins. It takes eight drafts. And Souter agrees to withdraw his concurring uh, opinion, which we've never seen. Uh, I didn't know it existed until uh, actually someone read it to me in their chambers. Uh, so I got a sense um, of what it, what it said. Um, uh, and so the book tells the story of this, you know, octogenarian Jedi master <laughs> at work getting that fifth vote, which is amazing if you know Stevens. Stevens was an iconoclastic justice when he first joined the court. He wrote for himself, he had his own distinct views, but as the senior justice, um, progressive justice, he became a master. And this case uh, was a masterpiece. And the book tells that story about the compromises he made and how he prevailed in Kennedy, Kennedy over. Uh, finally, the last chapter of the book talks about how history is made uh, based on, on this ruling. Uh, by the Obama administration, or the clean power plan, the motor vehicle rules, was every single rule that they did in those eight years on the EPA side, not the interior side, on the EPA side, was based on Massachusetts versus EPA. And every one of those rule things was necessary to convince the rest of the world the US was serious about climate change 
And unless the rest of the world believed that, there would have been no Paris. And it was a race to get those rulemakings done uh, by December 2015. Clean Power Plan was October 2015. Uh, when I started to write this book, uh, that was gonna be the end of my story. I started writing this in December 2015, right? Researching. I had one unanticipated challenge. Uh, I did not expect the November 2016 election. Now, maybe you all anticipated the results of the election. I did not. Maybe I was too much in Cambridge, Massachusetts to realize what was going to happen. So then I had a challenge. What to do about Trump uh, for my book? A narrow issue, what to do about Trump uh, more broadly. Um, and this is what I decided. I knew three things. One, I had to acknowledge it. Book is coming out in, in 2020. I had to explain its relevance. Two, I did not want this book to become another book about Donald Trump. I didn't want this book wed to the latest uh, event of the moment. This is a book with a half-life and a story about people and litigation and commitment and Supreme Court advocacy with a longer half-life than the latest little thing that Trump had done about climate change. Uh, and I wanted this book to have a half-life years from now when someone could pick it up, read the book, and get to the epilogue and say, who's Donald Trump? Uh, so that was the role of the epilogue. Uh, try to place the Trump presidency in perspective uh, and what lessons uh, the book story has for us all. So what are the, the lessons? Um, first, uh, what a difference uh, one person can make uh, in making history. Uh, second, uh, even the most historic Supreme Court rulings of the land aren't enough. It takes more than the votes of five justices uh, to actually have transformative change. Brown Board of Education had a lot of promise but by itself, it didn't transform America. You can see America today, uh, decades later, but it took laws like the Civil Rights Act passed by Congress to really have transformative effect. Massachusetts for TPA, enormous promise given to us by the court, but then there has to be follow. Truly transformative change requires votes, but not just the votes of justices, uh, but of individual voters. Uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States gives a jump start, but it's not complete. And that's why it's so important that people vote. Um, when I first published this book and I talked about it, I used the, the epilogue to talk about the importance of people voting. Uh, and why, of course, that's why they people did. And why this election this past November is so historic uh, for environmental law, you know, a real potential uh, turning point. Um, anyway, I'm delighted uh, to have this chance to meet you all uh, and to hear and answer your questions. And I think uh, 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 Kara is going to. Uh, uh, sort of find the questions for me. Thanks a lot. I'm going to unshare the screen too. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. That was great. Um, so just as a reminder, folks can type their questions into the chat box and I'm going to um, take the moderator's prerogative and ask a first one, but I already see a couple of good ones in there. Um, so as I said, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I thought it was interesting how you talked about the makeup of the court having swung somewhat rightward just before this case was decided with the additions of Justices Roberts and Alito. And about the change, I noted the quote from Justice Breyer that I think he said, it is not often in law that so few have so quickly changed so much. And that of course reminds me of more recent changes in the Supreme Court. Uh, which is now even further to the right with the additions of Justices Coney Barrett and Kavanaugh and others. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how you see the future of greenhouse gas regulation and even the future of, you know, applications of yeah. Massachusetts versus EPA in the new environment. I'll tell you what worries me, what doesn't worry me. It's obviously, a, if, if the court today were the court in 2007, 2006, this case would have been decided differently. I have no, no doubt about it. Uh, that does not mean, though, that this court will overrule Massachusetts versus EPA. They won't. Uh, and for a fairly fundamental uh, reason. Uh, the core part of the decision is a question of statutory construction. Uh, the court doesn't overrule questions of statutory construction. They just don't. Uh, you're very hard pressed to find an instance when they've done that. And they're not going to do it here. When it comes to questions of statutory construction, uh, they expect that if there's a mistake they've made, Congress will do it. It's a question of constitutional law, where you see there's only the only possible uh, avenue is for the court to rethink it. So I'm not worried about the core holding, whether greenhouse gas, I'm not worried about EPA's authority. 
to regulate greenhouse gas. I think that's settled. I think it's intact. And the court itself has relied upon it in subsequent cases, like American Electric Power v. Connecticut. They've made that now part of their jurisprudence. They're not going to revisit it. Uh, but what I'm much more worried about is the standing issue. That worries me. Uh, I don't think they'll overrule it, but I think they'll erode it. Uh, and so one thing that has to be done is effort people to work very hard not to take climate standing cases to the United States Supreme Court right now. Uh, well, questions of statutory construction, um, obviously we have a tougher pathway in environmental cases than we had before. And that's why you see you know, EPA and environmental groups not pushing the American Lung Association case, the big clean power plan case. They're doing everything they can not to have that case go to the Supreme Court right now after a big win in the DC circuit because they don't trust the court. Uh, with, with that said, I would not give up all hope, even with this very conservative court. It tells you what you have to argue and how you have to frame your arguments. And it's now going to be about text. Uh, and the EPA is going to go back and they're going to do a lot of good stuff with text and a lot of good stuff with uh, technology findings and economic analysis. They can do a lot. They'll do more than they did before. But it's about text. Uh, and I, I tend to believe, maybe I'm naive, I've done a lot of work before the court. If you have a strong textual argument, uh, you can win, even with very conservative justices. Um, uh, obviously, the e, e. Homer interstate air pollution case was won uh, with conservative justices uh, in, the, in the majority. Um, uh, the, uh, a case I argued years ago called uh, City of Chicago versus Environmental Defense Fund about the scope of Subchapter C of the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. Uh, we won that case. Uh, we won that case with Justice Scalia writing the opinion uh, in favor of EDF based on the plain meaning. Uh, a big Clean Water Act Section 404 case involving EPA's authority to veto Section 404 permits issued by the Army Corps of Engineers, opinion written in the DC Circuit by Brett Kavanaugh, uh, reversing a lower court which had ruled against EPA's authority to veto. Uh, the justices uh, have a different view of the role of agencies and the deference they can have with ambiguity. If you stick to language, we can do a lot. Uh, not as much as I might hope, but we can do a lot. And I, so I, I've not given up. I always tend to think I can win a case in the court. Um, so your answer and express, especially your expressions of worry about the standing doctrine um, relate to a couple of the questions that have come up in the chat already. Um, Stephen Sands asks where you think the future of this sort of special solicitude for state standing doctrine may be headed um, and to what degree you think um, this court might call Lujan into question on standing. Um, Katrina Ka asks whether you take any lessons from the debate about whether to seek cert in the Massachusetts versus EPA context for the Juliana plaintiffs today who are sort of in the middle of, of, of raging debate on that same question. Um, Juliana, of course, is the sort of youth versus government atmospheric trust um, climate case that uh, in which the plaintiffs lost in the Ninth Circuit recently. So I'm curious if yeah, you know, I, 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 my, I think the special solicitude thing is probably fairly secure in the court. I, I but I'm worried about it. Uh, the Chief Justice Roberts, in his dissent, attacked it. He actually had a pretty good argument for attacking it. Uh, the, the Georgia Tennessee Copper case was weaker than Kennedy thought uh, because of subsequent ruling uh, back in the early 20th century called Massachusetts versus Mellon. Uh, so there was a pretty good argument against the special solicitude. Uh, I think it's settled enough that I'm not that worried. I'm much more worried about the, the non-state standing uh, than about the state standing. Uh, the Juliana uh, case, this is the big Our Children's Trust case uh, recently where the, the Ninth Circuit panel uh, ruled against them on Article Three standing. This is the case where they're uh, seeking to make a pretty sweeping argument of federal constitutional law based on the due process clause uh, of a affirmative right to a sustainable uh, climate. Uh, and they lost on stain and the, they're now quite signaled they're seek, planning to seek Supreme Court review. Um, I, I would not take from Massachusetts with EPA uh, the lesson that every time people think it's a bad idea, it might be a good idea. Uh, I think that would be uh, the wrong lesson to take. Uh, my own view is that Juliana plaintiffs have done an incredible job uh, of, of um, promoting this issue and uh, making people aware of it. It's been a very important, effective political 
the organizing principle, I would not take this case in front of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, they will lose. Uh, I, I, I hope they don't, uh, but I really hope is the court denies review in the case. I really hope the court denies review uh, because if the court grants review, it's not gonna be Justices Breyer, Sotomayor and Kagan voting to grant review. Uh, when, when I talked to the justices about masters for CPA, uh, a, a very liberal justice, so I can't name because off the record, what that justice told me is they never would have voted in favor of you unless they were pretty confident they could get Kennedy to come over. They're not there to grant cases uh, unless they think they can win them. Uh, Kagan, Breyer, uh, and Sotomayor are not going to think they've got a, a path, an easy pathway to five votes with the current court. Uh, they'll be risk averse, uh, so they won't vote. So if it's granted, I don't think it's going to be good news. Uh, I think it's granted. I think the chief and others who are looking for a possible vehicle on Article Three standing, they'll never get to the merits. So it worries me uh, a great deal. It's the first first test we'll have. Uh, if the court denies review, uh, I think we're fine. I think the Juliana plaintiffs did was extraordinary over the past many years since October 2015. If they grant review. There may be celebration uh, by the petitioners. Uh, I won't be celebrating. Uh, I'll be very worried. Thanks. Um, the next question comes actually from one of our Emmett Institute fellows, Charlie Corbett, who's headed next to Charlie NBC, Corbett, a former student of mine. Well, there you go. So Charlie asks you, what is argument, what is oral argument for? What does it do that briefing doesn't? Yeah. Uh, the, the, first of all, the briefing is far more important. Uh, if you haven't done a good brief, the oral argument is going to be a disaster <laughs> because uh, the oral argument has sort of three roles that it plays. Uh, the first role is just answer some of their factual procedural questions. So they clear up things they don't understand. Uh, the second role is to articulate what your position is uh, in the case. Um, so they understand what your legal theory is. Then the, the most important part is the third part, which is testing out your legal theory whether it works with precedent, whether it works with hypotheticals, whether you can hold on to it as they try to beat it up and show its problems. Uh, if you don't have a good brief that articulates your position, you never get to the third series of questions because they spend all their time trying to figure out what your position is because it's not clear from your legal briefs. Uh, and so I've seen it happen. The person stands up there and they're trying to figure out what your legal theory, what's your position? What do you want us to rule? Um, and the person keeps changing their, their theory in response to different questions. There's no coherent sort of answer. They answer questions in inconsistent ways. Uh, and the justices at that point, they shut down. They're done because you're of no help. When Justice Byron White was on the court and I saw it happen, when that happened, he would literally swivel his chair around and start rocking, making it quite clear that you're of no help to us. Go away now, please. Um, so oral argument is about those third kinds of questions beyond just sort of clarifying uh, things. And it can make a big difference. Not always. Uh, you know, the biggest, important, most abortion case probably pays, makes less difference because uh, it's all about constitutional law, all about the court's own precedent. They know what they think. Uh, environmental law cases can make a big difference because they're not expert on these laws. They're not experts on the statutory provisions. And that's where they can be real value added. Uh, from the advocate. Uh, and I've seen, I've seen cases change at all. I've seen light bulbs go off at all. I see people come in incredibly aggressive and then you explain it to them and they go, oh, I see. Uh, the justices are fabulous lawyers, but they come in even to oral argument with misconceptions. Uh, they certainly have misconceptions when they grant cert in the case. It happens all the time. They grant cert to reverse and then they end up affirming, like the County of Maui case the big clean water case, they took that case to reverse. They thought they were going to reverse, then they, they figured it out. Uh, they figured it out. And actually the Earth Justice Lawyer for Hawaii Wildlife Fund did a masterful job at oral argument, pivoting to a new position that Justice Breyer offered him. That was good advocacy. So it doesn't make a difference in every case. The briefs are most important, but it can make, it can make a difference in some cases. And as a lawyer, let me tell you, it's a challenge. It's also really fun. All right, so this next question asks you to reflect a little bit um, on the book itself and asks, is there anything you would change or augment about the book based on reactions people have had to reading it? Um, that's a great, 
Oh, that's a great question. I certainly have a paperback version coming out. I've already made uh, a few little changes to it based on the uh, the November uh, election. Um, I really think how I'd answer that question. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the one thing, I, I don't know if I would change it, but I'm thinking about it. Uh, and that is uh, one criticism uh, I received from the book uh, is that the two lawyers who were vying for the argument, uh, one was a man and one was a woman. Uh, and the man got the nod over the woman. Um, and there's no question that Supreme Court advocacy right now um, uh, suffers from the fact that it is uh, predominantly male. Uh, it's not exclusively male. It used to be exclusively male. Uh, it's not, uh, but that's often because of public sector lawyers, uh, lawyers with the federal government, and lawyers with state governments, not as much with the private sector, which has got some very prominent, terrific women, but it's still skewed uh, compared to the quality of the actual bar. Um, uh, and so it's been suggested strongly uh, by one that uh, gender uh, played a role uh, in that selection. That is something I would think more about. Uh, I, I'm not convinced it happened here. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't know. Uh, I can't say I saw it, but you know, we know that those things happen all the time uh, in the workplace uh, and in law. Uh, so maybe that's something I should have thought more about uh, when I wrote, uh, when I wrote the book. Um, so uh, Speaking of women in the law, California lawyer Kate Keneally, who's been involved in many of these fights yeah, over the years, is, is with us. I had a feeling you did. And she asks, were there any amicus briefs in Massachusetts versus EPA that were consequential to the outcome? Um, yes. Um, th there, there were amicus briefs. There were a lot of amicus briefs filed in this case. Uh, and most amicus briefs don't make a whit of difference. Uh, they're just um, filed so people can say, they filed a brief, uh, and then they all they all claim victory uh, in the case. Uh, the good amicus briefs are the ones that have a distinct voice. And actually, as uh, as Cara knows, you guys filed a fabulous amicus brief just like this uh, in the Clean Power Plan and Affordable Care Energy case before the D.C. Circuit, which the court cited repeatedly. In, in this case, um, I, th I thought the um, there were two briefs which I thought were particularly effective, doing a distinctive voice uh, in it. Not in actually the outcome of the case. Amicus briefs are filed for outcome, but more importantly, they're filed for how you write the opinion. Supreme Court cases aren't just about judgment, reversed or affirmed, they're how you write the opinion. That's the ball game, is the opinion, whether it's broad or narrow. There was one amicus brief, uh, Kate, in the case, written on behalf of climate scientists, which I thought was very effective. Uh, in the case. Uh, and there's another amicus brief in the case filed on behalf of uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright um, uh, about sort of dumping on EPA's uh, purporting to use foreign policy reasons for denying uh, Joe Mendelssohn's petition. Um, both those briefs, I think, made it into the opinion. Uh, I thought both those were really nice target briefs. There might have been others as well. Most of them though were me too. I mean, you gotta remember, this is a case where you already have 12 states and like two dozen environmental groups on a, on a, on a brief. So you don't need a lot, more a lot more people making the legal argument. It, it made really well uh, in the case. Uh, but I thought those two were, I remember, there may be others. Those ones I remember, I thought were distinctively valuable. Thanks. Uh, so Joel Reynolds at NRDC, my former boss, hi Joel asks you to, spe uh, to speculate about potential changes in membership of the court that we may be likely to see in the next several years. And I think I'm gonna conglomerate this with another question that's also about the court in the next few years. And it's gonna ask you more substantively about your concern about the major questions doctrine. Yeah, well, I have a lot of concern about the major questions doctrine. <laughs> uh, um, well, one thing I just wanna point out as I answer this question, if the 2016 election had gone differently, we'd be talking about a completely different court. Uh, uh, right away, Merrick Garland would have been confirmed uh, in the fall of 2016, and we would have had a solidly progressive court for the first time in decades at that point, or at least a five justice majority that way. And we now, it would be solidified. So it, it just shows you what difference the election makes. Uh, we are way behind the curve 
on the Supreme Court because of the 2016 election. It's a long time to dig out of it. Now, I expect the next uh, uh, justice, it's a very closely divided Congress. Uh, and I think that uh, Joe Biden is aware of that. Um, I think Leanna Kruger for the California Supreme Court, uh, for obvious reasons, immensely qualified individual um, in, in traditional ways that will appeal to some centrist Democrats. Uh, I think she'll be a very strong uh, candidate, uh, Judge Jackson on the D.C. District Court uh, as well. I think there are a lot of very good people than other you know, folks. I always like Janice Kelly out in uh, Eighth Circuit on Iowa as well. I think things shouldn't just be D.C. Circuit. Uh, I like having people from all over the country with different life experiences. She'd be a great uh, justice on the court from a former, uh, I think, public defender, legal aid uh, lawyer. So I think we're going to see some good appointments. Breyer, I assume, will announce uh, this summer, if not sooner, that he's will be gone as soon as his appointment, his successor is confirmed. Uh, I'm sure he will do that. Uh, he lives a couple blocks from me. I feel like asking him, but I don't think he'd appreciate my walking down there and knocking on his door uh, and asking uh, him that question. Uh, but I assume he'll do it. Um, uh, there are many issues that concern me right now uh, with the current makeup of the court before we get some new justices, a lot of new justices on the court. Uh, and that major questions is right up there. Uh, and that's this basic notion uh, that the court should not defer uh, to an expert agency's interpretation of a statute of ministers uh, if that regulation it's promulgating addresses a major question. Uh, if it's a major question of law, uh, then Congress should speak to it directly uh, and the court should uh, not defer the agency. Um, I think that's um, both on the merits, uh, not uh, sensible. I don't think that's dictated uh, by the constitutional concerns of separation of powers, which is a justification that some judges and justices like Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh have given uh, for it. I don't think it's compelled. Uh, I think it's not the right way to make law uh, and current circumstances make that quite clear. Uh, why? We have pressing problems day to day. We have new issues come up and we have a broken uh, Congress. I um, mean, Congress has not passed any major new environmental laws with a couple medium exceptions since 1990. That's 30 years ago. Uh, and so agencies are forced to deal with these important pressing modern problems, which language that every year gets older and older. Uh, Air Act, that's the most recent, 1990. Endangered Species Act, what, 73. Water Act is like 87. Uh, you know, CERCLA is really we'll go back to 84, Superfund law. And so agencies have a challenge. And the challenge is you have language which uh, it does speak to the issue, but without any obvious notion that Congress thought about it, that particular application. And the court last term, I think, announced that question quite well in the gay rights, the Bostick and Clayton County cases, dealing with uh, the civil rights uh, protections for employment discrimination against uh, based on, um, um, you know, homosexuality or based on transgender status. And they said the language fits. As long as the language fits, the fact that Congress didn't actually think about it when they passed the law is no matter. I think that's the better answer to it. Um, I was glad the court went that way in those, in those two cases. I'm less confident they'll do it in environmental cases uh, because there tends to be a heightened skepticism among some of the justices about environmental regulation. And that has expressed itself often uh, in promoting the major questions. So of the things on my worry list, Article 3 is up there. Major questions is right behind. Uh, I could worry about non-delegation doctrine too, uh, but not quite as much as I worry uh, about major questions in Article 3 standing. Thanks. I'm going to give the next question to one of my students, actually, Cooper Cass. Um, he says he notes that you um, say that the best environmental lawyers are not the best environmentalists, they're the best lawyers. Um, but he wonders if we have time in light of the seriousness of the climate crisis for the best environmental lawyers to continue to do what he calls or to take what he calls baby steps or to do incremental work in the way that lawyers do. Yeah, I mean, it obviously, you know, there's force to his point, and that is that um, unlike many issues, um, climate change is time sensitive. Uh, the, the longer one waits, the exponentially harder 
it becomes to address and there are tipping points. You can't, you can't sort of reason away climate science uh, and the real tipping points uh, when things become uh, literally irreversible uh, in terms of catastrophic harm. So I get it. Uh, on the other hand, I don't, I, sorry, I don't think there are any shortcuts. Uh, and uh, I think that if you, if you put all your energy in the wrong thing, um, you lose. Um, and then you, you not advance the ball at all. You may have hurt things. Uh, if you want to put your energy in something right now, uh, it's not going to be the Supreme Court rescuing us from climate change. The federal courts aren't going to rescue us from climate change. Uh, it's going to be the only way we really make laws in the United States. And we can do it in a radical way. And that's through the process of electing officials who care about the issue. Uh, and if we pretend there are other ways to do it, I think it's wasted energy and wasted resources. Uh, that's why I think the best thing about the Juliana case is not what they actually get in terms of judicial relief, it's organizing. It's exciting organizing uh, young people to care and think deeply about this issue. And it's electing people. Uh, you know, getting Donald Trump out of the White House uh, was like an absolutely essential first step. Uh, and now it's going to be changed the minds of the American people uh, and electing more people to Congress to get that through. Uh, I wish there was a shortcut. It's just not how we make laws here in the United States. In other countries, they can actually do things maybe through the Supreme Court, uh, but we can't in the United States. And we certainly can't with the current court we have. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, not the wisest uh, step to try. On that note, I have to say, I had a sense of deja vu, and it wasn't particularly welcome. In reading your description of how the Obama administration came into office with guns blazing on climate in 2009 and put in place what you characterized and others have characterized as a climate change dream team in 2009. And I remembered the optimism. I remember very well the optimism we all had back then about the ability of the Obama administration to really push the ball forward um, in those years in a way that it, it um, succeeded in doing to some degree, I think, but not to the degree that many of us had hoped. And so we have, of course, a similar dynamic in place today in the early days of the Biden administration. And I wonder if you want to say a few words about yeah. what we can be doing to, you know, to fulfill those promises. Yeah, I, I think um, one is I think this administration is wiser from experience. Uh, I was actually I did the Department of Justice transition uh, for the Biden administration. I worked on the executive orders, which came out uh, on day one and a week later on, on January 27th uh, to try to right the ship, uh, put it back uh, on the right target. Um, so I think they're, I think Gina McCarthy in the White House is a major upgrade. I think they're gonna do everything they can possibly do in a savvy way uh, administratively uh, and not legislatively. Uh, so I think as much as possibly can be done, this group's going to do not just climate change, but for the first time ever, environmental justice as well. Uh, I think it's going to be historic on environmental justice in the Biden administration. Um, but it's going to be the, you know, it's going to be those uh, elections in 2022. Uh, in, in what happened, remember, of course, Car in 2010 uh, is, you know, Obama came in and he had what, a 78 vote majority in the House, and they had 60 votes in the Senate, and they lost the House in 2010. Uh, what he described as a shellacking, uh, right? They lost the House, and their Senate went from like 60 to 40 to 51 or 52, depending on how you count some of the independents. That can't happen in 2022. The, the fight right now is for 2022. Uh, to not have the House and Senate flip, but to have them expand, because we need climate legislation. So you can do as much as you possibly can do administratively. You work in all the states. Uh, you work on the businesses. Uh, you work with, you know, you work with the private sector to try to push them as they're being pushed, sometimes being pushed by other countries and sometimes pushed by some of the states. But it's going to be the 2022 election. Uh, and it's scary, uh, because the 2020 election, you know, was historic, but it was close. It was close. Um, so that's what I, I would focus on. Biden administration, everything they can. I focus on the 2022 election here in the United States. Thanks. I, I want to let you know that there's already one vote in the comments for you to get working on a sequel. And <laughs> in particular, Sandy Crockett of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District asks that that sequel 
potentially consider the UARG case on the tailoring rule. Any right. thoughts? <laughs> yeah, with those, I mean, I, uh, I can tell you, I just, I first decided to write a, decided to write a book like this. Uh, I promise it won't take again this amount of time, but I decided to write a book like this uh, in about 88, 1988, when I was in the Solicitor General's office, because I thought this is incredibly interesting, the Supreme Court advocacy and all the rest. And then I sort of waited for a case. Uh, and when Massachusetts received EPA came down, I went, there's my case. Uh, and then you have to figure out, you have to free up time. I do a lot of pro bono litigation on the board of EDF. I do a lot of stuff with NRDC and the rest. Uh, and it's hard to free up to do history when there's so much happening at the moment. Um, but I freed up. Uh, it took till 2015 to free up uh, to find the time. Uh, I was really fun. It was really fun uh, to write in this kind of more popular voice. So I love the idea of trying to write uh, a sequel uh, to it. Okay, and I think we have time maybe for one more question, and then I'll invite you to wrap up in whatever way you'd okay. like. But the last question is, um, in light of the likely dearth of congressional action over the next few years, what do you think the role of the states can and should be in picking up um, and continuing to carry in many ways the mantle yeah. of climate action? Every state should be like California, right? Uh, I mean, California has been the ball game for the past uh, several years, and everything we've been doing is trying to protect and promote what California has been doing. The states have done a huge amount. States have done a huge amount um, in the last uh, four years. They were doing it before, but they were the principal players. Uh, and I think you know we have is a federal government which does things, but not to, not preempting states and not excluding states, um, but actually having the federal government be the minimum and the states being allowed to go further. And one of the first things to do here is going to be defending the California waiver. Uh, the waiver allows California to have stricter greenhouse gas emissions on new motor vehicles. I think that'll happen happen soon, but I think that's a very important uh, role. Um, Great. And then at, any closing thoughts for a, a couple, you know, the many students thoughts. who are with us today or others? Yeah. And I have my office hours in a couple minutes, but that's all right. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, th th the reason I teach, the reason I give these talks is I think as much as I write uh, and I love teaching, and I'm sure, Carr, you feel the same way, and I'm sure every Barber Law faculty, Rob, uh, feels, Glixman feels the same way. The most important thing we do is launch students. Um, you know, and the most important thing we do is, is help launch the best minds to deal with this problem. This is not a short-term problem. I think it was your student cast suggested. We have to get laws in place, then we have to have them stick uh, and not be unraveled by the next impulsive president uh, that we get in office. Uh, and so that's a lot of work. We need some of the best creative minds uh, to work on these issues, not for a year or two, but for decades. So the most important thing I think we all do is launch students, uh, launch some of the best minds uh, in our classes out there to do this work. And that's why it's inspiring for me and, and fun to teach uh, and to give talks like this. Great. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. I learned a lot. I know our participants did too. Thank you all for being with us today. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Gar. It was really fun, really fun. And I'll exceed everybody too. All right. Okay, and, and go buy the book. All right, or, or buy two <laughs> copies, buy two. All right, all right. Bye folks, nice seeing many of you. Bye.